So we've got our lemma in hand, a uh, couple of lemmas actually, and uh, it's finally payday. So all of our hard work is going to pay off and we now collect. Uh, so we're going to prove the amazing extension theorem. And uh, it's still an involved proof, but uh, it's heavily going to rely on uh, many, many of the things we've proven so far. So I've already shown you the theorem statement, but here it is again, and let's go through it a little bit more carefully. So this is about the context where you have an algebra of sets, uh, fancy A, and a countably additive function. Then it tells us, um, actually before reading through these, how about just summarizing the uh, main interesting bit in a nice memorable slogan, uh, there exists a unique additive extension of mu, uh, sorry, there exists a unique countably additive extension of mu to the sigma algebra generated by A. That's the main thing that I think you should remember from this. Um, and further, so there exists a unique countably additive extension uh, of mu on the sigma algebra generated by A, and further, it is the outer measure. That's what it is. So it is this uh, mu star thing. Okay, let's go through these things uh, a little bit more carefully. So uh, first of all, A is gonna be contained in the set of mu measurable sets. And uh, if you look at outer measure mu star, then that is an extension of mu. So in this context, mu star is an extension of mu. That's not always true that mu star is an extension of mu. You need these hypotheses. Um, next, a mu, the collection of mu measurable sets, is actually a sigma algebra. Okay, that's big. That's bigger than it sounds like at first. A mu is a sigma algebra. Remember, a mu, we, we could describe the elements of a mu in a pretty nice way. So knowing that this is actually a sigma algebra, and that it contains a, tells us that it contains the sigma algebra generated by a. So a mu is uh, even larger than what we want to eventually extend mu to. It's even larger. A mu is even larger than the sigma algebra generated by a. Okay, so this is big. It's a sigma algebra. And also, uh, if you look at mu star, which is an extension of mu, if you look at mu star only on a mu, then that's countably additive. So when you extend it, you preserved this property of countable additivity. Uh, that is also a huge deal. So uh, remember, uh, even though a mu is large, mu star is actually originally defined on something much larger, the collection of all subsets of x, right? If mu is a non-negative uh, function, any function, then mu star will end up being defined on all sets. Every set has an outer measure. So this is why we're restricting it to a mu uh, and then saying that that's countably additive here. Okay, and then finally, uh, when you look at mu star restricted to sigma a, the sigma algebra generated by a, uh, which is smaller than a mu, so if you restrict mu star further to the sigma algebra generated by a, then uh, that is countably additive, yes, by part two, um, but it is the unique uh, non-negative countably additive extension of mu. Uh, and similarly, if you don't restrict as far, if you restrict only down to the mu measurable sets, then that's also the unique countably additive extension of mu. So here, let's, uh, let's sneak in a little definition into the theorem. Um, this function, mu star, on a mu, is referred to as the Lebesgue extension of mu. And if you start with the data in this theorem, so the starting data is x, algebra of sets, countably additive function, if you start with this data and then you go to this data, x, a mu, which is a sigma algebra, and then mu star, at least the part of mu star on a mu. So if you start with this data and then go to the, to the outer measure and the mu measurable sets, then that is called Lebesgue completion. So here you're starting with um, possibly 
I don't want to call it a measure space because A might not be a sigma algebra, it only needs to be an algebra of sets. But starting with this maybe almost measure space, but with this not being a sigma algebra, uh, and going to mu measurable sets, so growing this class A, and then extending mu, uh, this is Lebesgue completion. And if I'm going to call something a completion, if I'm going to say this is the Lebesgue completion of that, um, then definitely I should define what is complete, and then you might care to know that when you take a Lebesgue completion, then that's complete. So what does it mean to be Lebesgue complete? Or just complete? So here's the definition. So anytime you start with a, a measure space, um, so I guess you wouldn't refer to this as being complete or not, since A in this context is just an al algebra of sets, not necessarily a sigma algebra. But given a measure space, so set, sigma algebra, uh, countably additive function, uh, it may or may not be complete. We say it is complete, or more specifically, we say that mu is complete, or we say that the sigma algebra is complete with respect to mu if and only if the following happens. This is an interesting condition. I don't think we've discussed this before. Uh, whenever you take, whenever you have something in your sigma algebra, whenever you have a measurable set uh, which has measure zero, then any subset, uh, any subset of that set, must also be measurable. I wrote this in kind of a strange order, but uh, ho hopefully that makes sense. So completeness is this following, the following property. Any subset of a measure zero set is measurable. So hopefully that's sensible, that that's a property that you would at least want to have. Like if, if a set has measure zero, if a set is measurable and it has measure zero, and then you have a subset of that set, um, that ought to be measurable, right? Like, you can immediately come up with a good candidate for the measure. It should have measure zero. So typically we're talking about uh, completion or complete measure space when we're talking about the class of mu measurable sets, a mu. Um, the, the terminology doesn't necessarily apply when you're just, if you just put sigma of a here. Um, so, this, this idea of a complete measure space um, is sort of, a, it, it's a little bit bigger and better than just having, um, you know, a, a sigma algebra and a countably additive function. It's having a sigma algebra and a complete measure. So a complete measure is something better than just a measure. So this is an advantage that you get. Um, you know, the originally we set out thinking um, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we could extend our countably additive functions on plain algebras of sets to the sigma algebras they generate, but what we're doing here in the amazing extension theorem is going even bigger, bigger than just extending to sigma of A, we're, we're extending to the collection of mu measurable sets, and what we end up with is something better than just uh, a measure on a sigma algebra, we end up with uh, a complete measure on a sig on an even larger sigma algebra. All right, uh, we are now almost ready to begin our proof, but uh, first, since we're going to use a lot of earlier results, um, and I'm probably going to reference them by theorem number, uh, I think it would be nice to uh, start by reviewing some of those old results so that we can sort of have them uh, fresh in our minds uh, as we, right before we start the proof. So I've split up uh, sort of a summary of our old results based on two situations where they would apply. So uh, in white uh, chalk here, we have uh, the situation where you have an algebra of sets and a non-negative additive function, so good starting data. This is a good stuff to start with. Algebra of sets, non-negative additive function. And then in green, I'm going to describe um, some earlier results where we have total garbage for starting data. Just any old collection of sets, um, non, still a non-negative function, but literally any old function. And the only requirement is our collection of sets should have the full set x in it. 
Um, that's just so that the outer measure ends up being uh, defined. Okay, so again, I'm not saying anything new here. I'm just going to go through and uh, try to make sure that these things are fresh in our memory as we start to go through the proof. So actually, let me go down here first and uh, refresh on just the outer measure and the collection of new measurable sets. So the outer measure of a set, which can be any set, um, by the way, this is, this is defined in the crappy context where you have garbage starting information, just, just this minimal stuff. Then you can define the outer measure of any set and it's defined to be the infimum of the what I'm calling the approximations from above with respect to the function you started with, mu. Where approximations from above means the collection of these sums of mu's of sets where the sets are countable coverings of uh, the set that you're trying to approximate. Um, and we specifically put in here that the series should converge. Um, so we only consider the situation if the series converges. If we wanted to consider more, then we would include infinity here, but uh, we're just not doing that. Um, and finally, the collection of new measurable sets is the collection of subsets of x, which by making a modification, that's how I like to think of symmetric difference, by making a modification to them, um, which has outer measure, by making arbitrary, by making modifications with arbitrarily small outer measures, we can uh, turn those sets into sets that came from our original class of special sets. All right, so those, those definitions are there. And then let's just review these results. So let's start with the, uh, Let's start with this since we, we were talking about this setting just now. Um, so garbage starting information, any old function, any old collection of sets. Um, and then here I've got two results from proposition 15L1. So part one uh, is it tells you when A is a subset of A mu. So when, when is the collection of mu measurable sets a uh, larger set? Uh, when does it contain as a subset your original class of sets? Well, when the empty set is in the original class and the empty set has a mu of zero. Okay, so that does happen if A happens to actually be an algebra of sets, like in the white setting up here. All right, and part two here was that mu star, even if mu is total garbage and you have no idea anything about it, uh, the outer measure is monotone. Mu star, which is built from mu, will be monotone. Monotone meaning if A is a subset of B, mu star of A is less than or equal to mu star of B. Okay, and that's for all uh, subsets of X, A and B. All right, and then we also, uh, in the previous lecture, proved this lemma, which is mu star is countably sub-additive, with a big emphasis on sub, countably sub-additive. Um, and that's just... That just really amazes me that you can start with such garbage and then define something that has such a nice uh, property. All right, and then lemma 155, which we just got done proving, uh, is this inequality. Okay, uh, we just finished that one. So uh, at, in the white setting, uh, where you have good stuff that you're starting with, additive function, algebra of sets, uh, non-negative still, um, you have monotone also, this property. If A is a subset of B, mu A is less than or equal to mu B. And this time, I don't say for all A, B subsets of X, just for all A, B in there. After all, I can only evaluate mu at those kinds of things, right? Um, so these are all parts of proposition 139. So part two, mu is finitely sub-additive. So if you start with finitely additive, then you automatically get finitely sub-additive. And then part three, and this one, uh, I think, was the one that took the most work when we were working on Proposition 139, is part three. Uh, it gives you a, a necessary and sufficient condition for countable additivity. Mu is countably additive if and only if it's countably sub-additive. So 
That's not a generally true thing. Don't think, oh, additive and subadditive are now the same. Remember, this is in a context where you already have additive. So if you already have additive, then countably additive becomes equivalent to countably subadditive. But for example, remember down here in this setting where we said, uh, you know, mu star is always countably subadditive. Uh, it often happens that mu star is not even additive in the first place. So it's only countably subadditive with an emphasis on the sub. Okay, and uh, finally, uh, this lemma that we just got done proving also. So maybe I'll not go into that since we just talked about it. All right, I think we're ready to uh, begin the proof.